Hello, everyone. Welcome to the American Farrier's Journal Online Hoof Care Classroom. I'm Jeremy McGovern. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I want to get a few uh, technical announcements out of the way. This presentation will run about 30 minutes or so. After that, we'll have a Q&A session. If you look to the GoToWebinar control panel, you will see a tab for questions. You can submit questions throughout the webinar and we'll go through as many as possible at the end. Just don't ask Pat or Peter how to shoe your horse. We'll keep this strictly on topic. If you experience any techni technical difficulties, such as the audio uh, goes out or the display disrupts, and I don't interrupt the presenter about the problem, it's very likely on your end. In case of those issues, go to the web go to webinar helpline. So get a pen or pencil ready and I'll give those numbers to call. They'll be able to troubleshoot your problem. They're very quick to respond uh, according to your specific uh, machine or need. So if you're in the US, that number is 800-263-6317. And if you're anywhere else in the world, that number is 1-805-617-7000. Again, for the US, that's 800-263-6317. And anywhere else, uh, country code for US, 1-805-617-7000. If the webinar session crashes, Re-enter the webinar through the same link that brought you here. And if it crashes for all of us, I'll relaunch the session and we'll wait a few minutes and uh, get everybody back on to rejoin us. And then we'll pick up where the presenter left off. I wanna thank tonight's sponsor for this webinar and that's Equilox. You can learn more about their products at equilox.com. So with that, uh, bear with us for just a second. We're gonna get our presenters ready. I'm, I'm thrilled we have four presenters tonight joining us. This is a first ever for us. Three are in the UK and one is in Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna turn it over to the lead presenter and that's Dr. Renata Weller from the Royal Veterinary College. Renata, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for staying up late for us too. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk about our newest uh, enterprise really. Um, my name is Renata Weller. I'm the uh, Professor of Comparative Imaging and Biomechanics at the Royal Veterinary College. And I'm also the director of the new diploma course we're going to talk to you about. I'm joined by three friends, really. Uh, the first one is Rachel Davies, uh, who's the um, director of the Contemporary Study Skills module and learning support. Peter Day, who is our clinical ferret and also a student, a current student on the course and our friend and host at New Bolton Center, Pat Riley. And we're going to uh, discuss a little bit uh, research for ferries, is it necessary or even possible, and our new graduate diploma in equine locomotive research. So welcome to this session from a very rainy London, uh, and wherever you are, I hope the weather is better than here. So why do we do this? Um, I think anybody who works in the horse business has to have a love for horses. Um, the money is not bad, but equally you could make much more money elsewhere. So I love horses and uh, all the people on the course love horses. Uh, that's what it, why we do the job we do. And I don't really care whether it's successful racehorses or performance horses uh, or really uh, like my kids scruffy ponies at home. Um, that's what that's what counts to provide those creatures, those lovely creatures with the best possible care possible. And that's certainly in our eyes uh, on an evidence based, uh, uh, has to be on an on a evidence base. Now, we are all in the biomechanics lab and also in our clinics, we're all about lameness really. We all know it's the most common clinical problem. It's the most common cause of retirement. Uh, and it's, uh, hence it, uh, is a huge welfare issue as well as a huge financial uh, problem. You could be cynical and say, well, it also provides the vets with some income, which is certainly true. Sadly, the majority of lame horses never go back to previous performance, and that's over 50% of them. So surely that tells us that prevention has to be better than, than treatment. And really the people who are essential for that is the farriers, the people who look after the horses feed every few weeks 
uh, which uh, is much better, uh, this is uh, much better placed uh, to uh, provide prevention rather than us vets who only see the horse once uh, things have gone wrong. So uh, this is Peter uh, doing his job at the Royal Veterinary College and you will hear from him a little bit uh, in a little while. So in the last uh, decade or so uh, in medicine as well as veterinary medicine it's all about scientific evidence. What is out there to provide us with information that we can provide the best possible care and in 2014, I was asked to give a talk about what's the scientific evidence behind Ferrari. So I did a little bit uh, what's called a meta-analysis and I went out there and had a look how many peer-reviewed papers are there uh, publi published um, in this field. And uh, I could now ask you to hazard a guess and uh, think about it. Uh, and in 2014, it was a grand total of 157 papers. There's much more published in terms of uh, what we would, in, in the scientific world, would be classified as lay papers, where somebody expresses an opinion. And that opinion is often absolutely correct. However, to make it scientifically proven uh, or scientifically valued, you have to prove this. And how does 157, how did that come about? So in this slide, on the uh, x-axis, on the premier of the years, I started in 1917 and stopped in 2014. And on the y-axis going up, you have the number of publications. So for a long while, you had about two or three uh, publications a year. It went up in between 2001 and 2004, five to four or five publications, and then it went back down to three publications. So maybe you think, well, maybe this is what's happening in the horse world compared to humans or dogs. But just so to give you an idea how this sits in relation to other areas, this is my other field of expertise. This is equine diagnostic imaging. And in 2014, at the same time, I looked at the various uh, scientific publications. I also looked at the equine diagnostic imaging publications. And they were just short of 4,000 and steadily rising as this graph below you. So at the moment, and there's about, we are now 2017, with about you know, between 80 and, 100, 80 and 100 new publications in this field every year. Whereas in the fairy world, we are still between, depending on the year, between two and maybe a maximum of five scientific publications. So why is that? Why is there such a discrepancy uh, between fields when really, uh, you know, the feed should be of the major interest. Is it a lack of interest of the people involved? I don't think so. I mean, we, we, you guys are listening in, so you uh, must have a reason for that. So I assume you're not here by mistake, but locked in uh, because you're interested in this. Is it a lack of funding? Maybe. Uh, however, you can do a lot of research on and very good research on a shoestring, really. Is it a lack of research skills? And I think that's a little bit uh, of an issue. And hence, we reacted to that. If we look at funding, there is funding out there for horses. There are certain charities. Uh, there is certain uh, grant funding, government grant funding bodies here in the UK as well in the US. And there is some very exciting uh, new things afoot. There's going to be a new charity that's just been launched the Sport Horse Research Foundation. And I expect great things from them. Uh, I uh, expect them to fill that gap where we can find funding for the performance horse, especially dressage and uh, dressage and show jumpers. And therefore I've already spoken to them and they have a big interest in horse feed and ferrary. So I'm, I'm quite uh, optimistic that uh, funding is not going to be such a big issue to find. Now, is it lack of research skills? Um, every single fair knows you need the right tools and you need the skills to do the job. And that's exactly the same when doing research. It's uh, not something we are born with. It's uh, skills and uh, knowledge one has to acquire. 
um, through studying and through practicing, really. So we thought, why not provide people um, with the training in this area, which is our daily job. So we established this uh, graduate diploma in equine locomotion research. And this is not a course designed to teach um, anybody ferrary. This is a course designed for ferrers to learn how to do research. And it's a level six degree within the UK higher education framework. And the highest degree you can get to is a level eight. A level eight would be a PhD. A level seven would be a master's degree. So it just sits below that uh, at the same level as, for example, a bachelor's degree, a BSc. At the moment, it carries 90 credits, which you could then, if you would successfully complete this course, you could then use to go on uh, to a master's or a PhD. It's a part-time course. It runs over two years. It has six modules and it uses a blended learning approach. So it's an online, it has an online component as well as six residential weekends. We expect you to spend 10 to 15 hours a week on this. Now, if people hear this, they automatically go, oh my God, I can't sit in front of a computer for 15 hours a week. That's not what this is about. This 15 hours of week, uh, hours per week uh, spending on that also includes thinking time. So this could be you and your car, in your car driving to the next uh, job and thinking about uh, certain problems uh, that is the topic uh, of that particular week. Or you picking up the phone or going to a meeting with other ferries or vets, uh, or anybody else really for that matter in discussing uh, uh, topic related issues. So this is all uh, also counts to those 10 to 15 hours a week. The modules start off with the contemporary study skills module and uh, Rachel is going to talk to you about this in, in a second. Once you've succeeded with this, we are going to move on to equine locomotive biomechanics and orthopedics. And this is really uh, a module that's uh, content, uh, that's about uh, content. So we're trying to get everybody to the same level, what we think uh, is necessary to go on to the rest of the course. And then the next step starts with the research training as such, which starts with a critical evaluation of scientific literature then moves on to study design and locomotive assessment methods, then on to data processing analysis and presentation. And finally, it all comes together in the research project. So what will you do in the equine locomotive biomechanics and orthopedics module? You will gain a thorough understanding of the functional anatomy of the horse and also of the orthopedic and other problems affecting the locomotive system. And we will uh, help you to develop a systematic approach to gait and hoof assessment and to document your findings. How will we do it? Uh, it's six weeks of online learning. We will uh, use a combination of videos, reading material, quizzes, discussion boards. It will have two residential days. And the assessment, and everybody is scared of assessment, absolutely everybody, I'm scared of assessment. Um, however, I think I want to emphasize that the assessment we use is not what you may remember from your classroom time. It's not about um, regurgitating knowledge. It's about demonstrating that you thought about a problem. So for that first module, the assessment is a hundred word reflective case report where you choose a case that puzzled you, where you had to uh, do a little bit more thinking whether, that you discussed. And we want you to describe the case, but more importantly, we want you to outline what you learned from this case. The second part of the assessment, it's a one page gate assessment report. So we want you to video a horse and then describe to us what you could see and how you documented it. The people involved, the module leader, is uh, Dr. David Bolt, who is one of our orthopedic surgeons uh, with a special interest in uh, the feet and ferrary. 
He's helped the uh, deputy module leader is uh, Dr. Thilo Pfau, a computer scientist who is specialized in uh, gate assessment and who is fooling around with Peter here during an experiment. Um, Sarah Chenin, Dr. Sarah Chenin is joining us. She is uh, heads our anatomy department at the moment and also holds a PhD in uh, locomotive biomechanics and myself. Um, so we are going to uh, help you go through this uh, module together. We then move on to critical evaluation of scientific li literature. What will you do? What will you learn? You will be proficient uh, in performing a thorough literature search. You will be able to critically evaluate that literature. And you will be proficient in using a computer-based reference management program. And we want you to show us that you can do all this after uh, at, the end, at the end of the module by writing a scientific literature review. So again, it's not a test where you answer question. It's something you do at home where you produce a, a piece of uh, a written piece that you can use later as the first part of your research thesis. And the people running that is Sarah Chenin, helped by Amy Barstow, who's currently doing a PhD in the effect of showing methods on vibrations and who has a keen interest in ferro-related uh, literature as well. Uh, then it gets a little bit more deeper or it gets a little bit deeper into um, research methodology. We're going to talk about study design and equine locomotive assessment methods. At the end of that module, you will understand what different types of study design are out there and you will be able to choose the correct design for your research question. And at this point, we would like you to take your own idea, to pick one, I'm 100% sure all of you have loads of ideas. However, at this point, we want you to choose one and decide uh, what study design you would use for this and write a study proposal. And we want this very practical. We want you to state your aim your formulate hypothesis, describe the methodology, and include time and cost estimates. We can all design the most marvelous studies if we would have millions available, but we want this to be as practically applicable as possible. Now, for this, uh, we I've managed to talk Jackie Cardwell into helping us, uh, who is one of our epidemiologists and has done a lot of work in uh, working equids in, in third world countries and had vast experience in all sorts of different study designs. She's joined by Kim Stevens, who is one of our statisticians, who has also an interest in horses, and Tilo will help with the locomotor assessment methods. So as you can see, we're trying to give you the best of the best and tailor it to each uh, each. The same team once, well, after this, you're going to go off and collect data. You're going to collect your own data uh, in your own uh, time with your own caseload. Uh, you can also come to us and we do something here. We can organize for you to work with all sorts of people depending on uh, your research question. And once you have your own data set, we will help you uh, to learn how to process and analyze the, these data, and then uh, finally how to present it. So the assessment method for this then will be your presentation of your data, including tables uh, and appropriate figures. So I think you can already see where this is leading. This is a step-by-step, -step, almost Lego block approach for you to finally end up with a research thesis. And we want this to be publishable. The way are employed to produce science and uh, we're going to get all our students, we're going to push you very hard to produce something publishable. So we want to see a research thesis that can be between 3,000 and 5,000 words, and it will fulfill the requirements for the, so you can submit it if you should be eligible and should choose to do so uh, for the fellowship, for the thesis part of the WCF fellowship. And we would like you to present this and also do an oral defense of it. And for this, uh, in addition to the tutors you've already met, 
I've roped a load more in. I've shown you some here. We have Professor Roger Smith on the left, our head of surgery, who does a lot of tendon-related research. Nicola Menzies-Gau, one of our equine medicine specialists who uh, has published vastly on laminitis. Andy Fitz Jackson, another one of our surgeons. Uh, so basically, you can choose what you want. We will find the appropriate supervisor for you, depending on your area of interest. So loads of people. Now, um, education is uh, expensive. There's no two ways about that. It costs money. Uh, I think it's reasonably priced. You might disagree because you have to pay it. Uh, the Contemporary Studies Skills course, which is the first part, is priced at 1200 pounds which as of uh, last week was about 1500 dollars the main course is uh, 4800 pounds which is just over 6000 dollars so the grand total is under 8000 dollars um, so compared to a lot of other courses at level at the same level at level six this is actually uh, I have to tell you that this is dirt cheap um, and the college is doing this. Uh, they, they said to me, uh, we are not allowed you to lose, we, we won't allow you to lose money because that would be unfair. However, uh, we want this because we feel it's the right thing to do. And as long as you break even, you can run this course. Uh, so, and that's what we are doing. Why should you come to the RVC? We turned 225 years uh, old last year. We are the oldest and biggest veterinary school in the UK um, and one of the oldest in the world, really. Uh, and we started, up, uh, started out with farriers. Um, we had uh, six farriers to start with. Uh, the college had to close because of the unruly behavior of its students in the first year, but after then it was relatively smooth sailing. Uh, Right from the beginning, uh, biomechanics and locomotion of the horse played a central role. This is from our founder, Vial de Sambel, who tried to make predictions how Eclipse, the famous racehorse, could be so fast. He got it utterly wrong, uh, but at least he gave it a good go. Today, we are home of the biggest animal-related biomechanics lab, the Structure and Motion Lab. Uh, we have a lot of toys. It's good fun to, to work there. Uh, we also have the clinical expertise. We have a big equine referral hospital. We are well staffed. Uh, we, are, we are well equipped. I can't really complain uh, about the lack of colleagues or, la or lack of toys, really. But what's probably uh, most important is we have experience with applied foot research and we have experience in doing this with students. Uh, so we are very proud to have Chris Pardo, who you can see on the right upper corner, who was the first uh, Ferry, who gained a PhD from a university in the UK, and he's going to help with the course as well. Now, you know, you can be the best in the world, but uh, that doesn't mean you can teach. Uh, two weeks ago, we got awarded uh, a gold medal in teaching uh, within the Teaching Excellence Framework. This is literally unheard of for a relatively small university like ours, so we are extraordinarily proud. And uh, one of the, uh, the main reasons why we managed to get this, despite being much smaller than everybody, than all the competitors, was the dedication of our teachers. And I don't think there's a more dedicated team than our learning support team. And with this, I'm going to hand over to Rachel. Thank you, Renata. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, what a lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Rachel Davis and I'm part of the RVC Learning Development Team. I ran the team for about seven years and um, have a huge amount of experience supporting students in their learning. So that's me, should anybody want to contact me after this webinar. So we're running a module which sets you all up for oops we're running a module which sets you all up for um for learning now at the rvc we have students coming from a really wide range of backgrounds so we've got loads of experience of working with students from vocational backgrounds from um students who haven't been 
in um, a university setting before who've had a long time out of high school and taking those students and preparing them for success in a higher education institution. So our module prepares you, our students, for future success in content modules in the graduate diploma. Renat has taken you through some of those modules and I'm thinking that some of you might be starting to um, leap with joy and, and you know, can't wait to dive in because that's the kind of thing you love doing and you feel super confident. But others of you might be feeling a little bit nervous and anxious and completely um, overwhelmed by the type of work that you would need to undertake. And our job really is to increase your confidence and your competence as learners so that you can go forward and really enjoy your time on the graduate diploma. We do three things while you're with us. Um, we're developing an online learning community so that the students on the course who are all from um, all areas can learn to work together online. It's a pretty tough thing to get to do and it's probably one of the most important things that you'll do in our module because once you're all working together, the, the output of the work, the support that goes on there um, sets you up for future success and um, is really helpful in terms of enjoyment and lowering stress levels. We're also going to equip you with essential online learning skills. Some people come to us where they're complete whizzes in um, technology, but many of our students, particularly our mature students, our vocational learners, may not have such experience in online learning. And so we sit with you, we spend the time helping you um, log on, work with new equipment and, and work your way around an online learning environment. Finally, um, and also importantly, we're here to develop your core academic skills. So um, we take you through all the skills you're going to need for success um, in your ELR modules. So what's involved? This is a 14 week online study program program and as Renata said you're expected to be doing about 10 to 15 hours a week of self-study but also to reiterate her point this isn't you sitting in front of a laptop um, or with a huge number of textbooks in fact we'll come and tell you off if that's what you're doing this is you thinking reflecting talking to colleagues talking to us uh, and generally moving forward your understanding of yourself in the workplace we set you weekly tasks and we have lots of materials for you to work through and we ask you to post um, on a weekly basis in our discussion forum. We're going to work on things like online learning, we're going to look at you as a learner um, and give you some great study skills so that you can be effective and efficient. We're going to help you find information as Renata said, the quality information that you use in your work going forward going to be really important. We'll help you with reading skills. So many students went through school not really understanding um, simple skills like speed reading, scanning, skimming, things like that. Um, we'll help you with your academic writing and we'll help you with referencing the information you're using. This is all going to lead you gently and carefully towards two assessments, one of which is um, a discussion forum post where you reflect on an incident of poor communication in, in your workplace. And the second builds on that where we ask you to write a reflective essay on that scenario or another scenario on that communication breakdown. What have we learned from um, running this module? Well, in spite of being out of school, for some students up to 20 or 30 years, all of them quickly get to grips with the learning requirements the course so it is absolutely possible for you to come from any kind of background you may have really struggled at school you may have struggled with reading and writing and um, we are equipped to help you get where you need to be and we've worked with students with all sorts of specific learning differences as well um, our farriers are some of the most motivated and dedicated learners we have ever met and the peer support is incredible i've never seen such an active online forum and um, you know these guys are basically have been working with each other um, in in the course and outside. Um, I will say that the quicker you get to grips with technology and the better Wi-Fi signal you have seems to have a big impact on um, your stress and your future success. Um, it is an important part of this course. Um, 
all of our students have got loads going on, um, loads going on at work, those going on at home. They somehow manage to find a way to balance this pressure of study with those things. And I think it's because we align the learning with the workplace. So everything you learn with us, the next day when you go into work, you'll be using that new understanding of yourself and your work life. And actually, because we're focusing on communication, um, we have found that we're actually helping people um, communicate better at home too which is an added bonus. And I want to finish by saying this has been some of the most enjoyable teaching I've done. I've been teaching in science and then latterly in, in academic development for 20 years. And my work with the Farriers has just been an absolute joy. So um, I'll be looking, really looking forward to hopefully meeting some of you at a later date. And with that, I'll pass on to um, Pete Day, who is one of our current students. Hi. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for dropping in to this webinar. Um, yes, I'm one of the inaugural guinea pigs on the uh, uh, diploma course, and um, I would have been a fool not to have signed up. Being the clinical farrier at the RBC, um, I took it with open, with open arms because it's something that um, is close to my heart, research, um, and and I, even though we just done, just only finished the contemporary study skills module, I have learned so much, and I've learned it so. I'd like to say easily, but not easily. It's been a hard slog, but it's been a good hard slog. And the team of farriers that are all on this course, we we sort of bonded. We stuck together like glue, and we were talking and chatting amongst each other on Skype um and via email to get the task done um the the people behind the screen um working on the web rachel and her team uh i think are absolutely fabulous because it's like having someone sitting in the room next door you have a problem about what you're doing you can email them and the response is almost instant um and they guide you through take you through the the whole the whole process and when i finished my 3000 word communication skills essay i was almost reluctant to let go of it because i kept thinking i could make it that little bit better to get a slightly better mark so having gone into it rather thinking it was all going to be rather daunting um, and i think i can speak for all the others we came out the other side of this first module um all really pleased with what we've done and we're so looking forward now to the next module and the people that are going to be working on that are again really good at what they do they know they know how to teach and that's half of it um and they'll yeah it's hard work um have i got no um yeah it, it's it's hard work um and there are things. Sorry, uh, I'll leave it. And there are things. There are things in there that, um, that you know we're gonna. You're gonna pay a lot of money to be on the course, um, but it's worth investing in yourself and um, and time and money um, in pushing your ideas forward and putting them into some kind of some kind of uh, structure um we we all see we all do this all the time uh, at work we we do things we do things in work and in in a funny sort of way we're doing research we're looking at things and maybe photographing things and wondering about things and it's um it is a really good uh, it's a really good course and i'm i think um those of you who want to come on board um will get a massive amount out of it so I think on that note, being as the time's running out and we want to get to Pat, that um, I think I'll, I'll call it a day there. But really, it's a great course, well worth being involved with. And uh, we hope to see, you know, hope to see some of you guys on board. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Pete, for that. Uh, so the RBC goes to the US. Why? I put, a, I put a map up here which shows you the distribution, the red dots are the distribution of where those February publications come from. And there's a fair few out of the US, uh, but in relation to the number of ferries there, I think you guys can do better. So uh, hopefully we see many more red dots there. And 
we were very lucky that uh, Pat is a friend and said, oh, oh, come on, I work with you on this one. And with this, I'm going to hand over to him and he can tell you why he volunteered to host this. Hello, Pat. Um, I don't believe anybody can hear you. You may need to unmute yourself. There we go. Is that better? Better. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Renata. Uh, there's a really easy reason why I wanted to be part of this. Um, the first is that my interaction with Renata, um, with Chris Pardo, with Peter, with Tilo, people in, and, and Rachel, people that I've met at various conferences, they are a really uh, strong team that really obviously work well together. And I was instantly impressed by that. Uh, when this program started last year in the UK, I actually applied um, to be part of the first class. And due to visa restrictions and due to some other structural, the way the course is set up, students from North America were not eligible uh, to participate in, in the program in the UK. Uh, the obvious answer for me, if you can't, you know, can't bring a bunch of farriers to London, can we turn around and bring some instructors to the US so that, that North American farriers would have access to this program. Um, and thankfully, Renata, I think, was receptive to the idea of this, and I, I hope we can make this work. Uh, I think from a you know, logistics point of view, the uh, farrier climate in North America is, is a perfect setting. We have, and thank you, Jeremy, and the American Farrier Journal for some of these numbers, you know, 40,000 farriers practicing in North America with a, a large amount of money. This is a $3 billion annual industry with over 7 million horses in the United States alone. Um, we have a lot of things going for us. And there is no true academic branch of farriery anywhere in North America. On top of which, and, and most of the audience, you know, listening to this will understand this, uh, anybody in the U.S. can go out without any education whatsoever and call themselves a farrier. You can buy some tools and go into work uh, tomorrow. And that's not uh, the situation in the United Kingdom, uh, where there is a mandatory education system and a registration system and a, uh, a licensing system. Uh, so I think the need for it in the United States is actually a little bit more than what you would find um, in parts of Europe. Um, I do... Uh, I think if we get forward to the next slide right here. Uh, I do think Penn has. Oh, I don't know that I have power to move to the next slide. This is some, there we are. I did it. That's okay. Thank you, Renata. Um, I do think Penn has a long history of working with farriers. Um, out of the 40 farrier, uh, 40,000 farriers that are practicing in North America, we have a grand total of out of 30. Uh, large uh, veterinary teaching schools. I think we have a grand total of seven farriers now uh, working in those institutions. And Penn is one uh, institution that's had a farrier working uh, with the veterinary community uh, since the inception of the school in the 1800s. So I, I do think we have a, a long history, and I'm very grateful to, uh, to my administration at Penn. Uh, for helping to support this and helping to, you know, provide some space and, and uh, help the RVC to come over and being supportive in, in having another veterinary institution come over and, and offer uh, this program to U.S. farriers. Quite honestly, I, I think the education system in the U.S. and in Europe is, is different. I think the idea that, that uh, you know, we can offer this level of degree uh, to farriers that, that don't have the, you know, a large amount of college experience. And as I understand it, college experience is not a prerequisite for uh, attending uh, or participating in this program. Uh, I, I would echo a lot of what both Rachel and, and Renata stated. I, I think farriers are incredibly passionate about what we do. And I think we are fantastic uh, at making observations. And unfortunately, there's a big step in between making observations and proving a fact, uh, proving you know, a hypothesis. And that's where we let down. And I think the support system and the program that, that the RVC has put together uh, is exactly what the farrier community needs. Uh, and I think the potential 
for farriers not only to get uh, this graduate diploma, but also to potentially uh, pursue a master's degree or a, a doctorate degree uh, in equine locomotor research. I, I think you know those are degrees and and uh, qualifications that would be recognized by. Uh, any member of the horse owning public, uh, the veterinary community of the research program, uh, research community. I, I really do hope uh, that the farrier industry in the U.S. gets, gets behind this and is, is open to, uh, to this type of program. Thank you, Pat. Thank well, you. I, the, I have to say, uh, the, really, Pat did exactly that. He said, well, if I can't come over here, can't you come to the US? And I said, OK, let's look into this. So he was the visionary here. I, I have to give him all that credit for this. So thank you. Uh, uh, th thank you, Pat, for this. So yeah, come and join the team. Now, over here is a raging discussion that uh, the RBC is trying to undermine the Ferrari as a craft. That's not at all true. I mean, the fact that uh, you see Grant Moon here with a computer on the right bottom corner doesn't mean he doesn't know what to do with a hammer anymore. It's just we are adding to the Ferrari's skill set rather than taking away. And uh, yeah, come and join the team. So what does this mean? What, how can you join the team? Uh, as Pat quite rightly said, you don't need a college degree. And uh, this was a little bit of, um, yeah, uh, we had to be a little bit creative that this is, we, we, we could make sure uh, people without a college degree could enter a higher education or university uh, degree program. And this is all thanks to Rachel because the contemporary study skills basically is designed to bring you up to the level that you can work and study at a level six degree. And so she's take, taking care, she and her team are take, uh, taking care of the academic requirements. What we need you to bring with you though is your foot care experience. So we want to see some evidence of foot care training. And this doesn't necessarily, I, I know about the situation in, in, in the US being different from the UK. So this doesn't necessarily mean you have to have gone, undergone formal training, but you need to show us that you have uh, done things that show your dedication to becoming the best fairy you can possibly be. And this includes evidence of continuous professional development. So going to courses, attending uh, conferences like the International Hoof Care Summit, uh, it's about uh, attending workshops, learning from other people and so on. We want to see a minimum of a two year advanced training period. Uh, we want to see that you have been not uh, just doing what somebody else told you to do, but we want to uh, see that you have been in charge of making the decisions, how to take care of that particular horse's feet. We want to see a variety of caseloads. So somebody sent me an email yesterday saying, how many cases would I have uh, need, do I need to, to fulfill the requirements? It's not about the number of cases, it's about the quality of foot care and the variety and the diversity of cases. So you need to show us that you have the skills and knowledge to deal with problem horses. Uh, what do you do with different types of laminitics? What do you do with different types of uh, heel pain? Uh, what do you do with the chronic hind limb lame horse and so on? So we want to see evidence of this. And uh, we also would like you to demonstrate us that you can work within the team. And for this, we would like to see a reference letter from a veterinary surgeon confirming that uh, you have worked with him uh, in, collaborative, uh, in a collaborative manner. And this is all, uh, uh, you find the form where you can make all those uh, statements and put together uh, your application when you go to the web page. It has a rather long uh, address, I'm afraid, but if you just Google GradDip ELR, it uh, brings you to the link. And on the left-hand side, under our 
have gold, have I mentioned that we are very proud of this? I think I've mentioned this, uh, is how to apply. And if we press on, to, on the how to apply button, it, it brings you to the page that outlines the requirements and also where you can download the form. And this form needs to be sent uh, to our admissions team who will then look through the applications. So this brings me to an end. We are happy to take any questions. I would like you, uh, I would like to thank you for listening. I would like to thank Jeremy and the American Ferris Journal for allowing us to do this webinar. And hopefully we will be able to welcome you uh, soon to the team. And of course, thank you to my co-presenters for helping me do this. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, this is Jeremy McGovern with American Farriers Journal. Uh, to alert you, on the GoToWebinar control panel, there's a section for questions. Uh, feel free, if you haven't done so, to type some in. Uh, you have a tremendous opportunity right now of, of four different perspectives regarding this program, so uh, easy access to get your questions answered tonight. And I'll go through these as they've come in. Some of them have gone over, uh, they cover information we may have already gone over, but uh, uh, certainly if you uh, came in late, we'll get to those. I'll also remind everyone that uh, we'll have this webinar up as a video tomorrow by 5 p.m. Central, and we will uh, email out that link to you. So I'll go with a, a first question here, and uh, I'll throw it out there. Everybody who's a presenter is unmuted. Um, uh, this may be best for you, Renata. Uh, do you see a particular breed or discipline, especially here in the U.S., that would be ideal for, for a farrier to study? Oh, my God, the world is your oyster. I think you can study. Uh, you can study absolute everything and anything. Uh, I think all breeds have their problems. I mean, there's some that uh, are just general to horses. Uh, but if you have a certain caseload, if you have certain things in mind, if you see particular issues very commonly, go for it. it. My main advice to any student who comes to me is pick a research project that rocks your boat. Pick yeah. something where you get excited about. And uh, because it's hard work, as Pete said, it is hard work. There's no two ways about it. But I mean, if you enjoy something, it's not hard work anymore. So pick something you have come across and you think, I really want to know why this is or what I could do better. That's what I would say to this. Okay. Uh, would it be possible to, to only do the online work or is there maybe a variation of, of this program to only do the online work? Uh, so I assume the question is, uh, could it be done without the residential weekends? Yeah, I'm assuming so, David. If if we're not answering your question, uh, feel free to resubmit it. But but let's go ahead with that that premise, Renata. So no, at the moment the uh, residential weekends are compulsory. Uh, we have an absence policy. So for example, if there's a good reason why you miss uh, a weekend due to illness, bereavement, God forbid, or or getting married. Um, that is all excusable, but usually it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the norm. Uh, we have been toying with the idea to produce an online-only course. However, the feedback from our first cohort was that that first weekend they did together uh, really helped them to form an online, form a later on an online learning community. So at the moment, I think we will keep with that structure and maybe in the future we might consider it, but at the moment it's not in the pipeline. Yeah, can, can I just butt in there? Am I live? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, beyond, the, the residential weekend, um, they really are great fun and really important. And we really got together as a unit on the first weekend. And we're so looking forward to getting together um on the next one because uh yeah it, it's it's uh it's it makes when you go home it makes everybody real um in the meeting room online it makes everybody real and you just it, it's i think if it had just been online it would be 
probably not as much fun. And there is got to be an element of fun in it. If you don't get fun out of it, it's not worth doing. As could I, I'm going to butt in here too and say that we, we did have a student who was getting married and, and couldn't attend. And, and that student this year really needed a lot of extra support and, and felt uh, they had missed out on some of those nuances that you only get from being with the other people. So um, it was a real uphill struggle for the person that wasn't able to attend that weekend. Okay. Um... Hey, here's a person who uh, uh, they're very interested in this program, uh, likely will not be able to uh, uh, enter it at, at this, this current time, but is probably looking, you know, if it takes off here in the U.S., is looking to do it uh, maybe a couple years down the road from now. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw this out uh, to everyone. Uh, what can he or she do in, in preparation in, in that time to, to better prepare themselves for, for the, uh, the work down the road? Shall I take this? Yep. Okay. So uh, to me, the, the, there's two things uh, people need to bring. Uh, well, maybe three things that people need to bring to this course. The most important one really is being nosy, being curious, uh, trying. If you're one of those people who want to find answers, this is the course for you. And to open up your mind and start thinking as you drive away from a job, or in my case, I've seen a horse, and often as I drive home in the evening, I think, okay, what, what could I have done better? What could have helped me here? Uh, and if there's nothing out there that I could read up on this particular horse, what could I do? Uh, what study could I design to answer the questions that that particular horse may have? uh you know may have brought about so i think getting into the practice to reflect on cases one sees during the day uh, is a good habit to go into also trying to start reading around uh, i mean i love friends uh, who um, uh, i shouldn't be saying that now should i jeremy that is a bit mean <laughs> uh, but uh, keeping Keeping up to date with all the all what's out there in the media, uh, with what Jeremy puts on, with what friend puts out there, and just being genuinely an interested person in the subject. Uh, that's all I would ask for from a from a person. There's Renata, could I add a couple of things? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so to add to that, if it, it may just you know that may be the kind of thing you need, and then. Some of you may also, as Renata said, want to start reading a bit more and increasing the complexity of the material you're reading because it can feel like a big leap. So if you are in any way able to, um, if, if you're able to start reading more, reading more complex material, if you um, can get to grips with technology. So we have some students who really hadn't used iPads or laptops who hadn't worked in online environments very much at all, that can be really useful to get to get started with. Um, and as Renata said, reflection is massively important. And you can download reflective models from the internet, so forms that get you asking yourself, what, so what, now what? And, and writing those things down, thinking about those things, will get your brain working in a way um, so that you're ready to hit the ground running with us when you, when you come on the course. Okay, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, you know, obviously there's the, you know, the the interest, there's the joy of, of pursuing something like this, the sense of accomplishment. Uh, but there's a couple of questions here, and like I said, I'll try to combine them. Um, how do you see this uh, rewarding a farrier once they they complete it and are back out in the field? Is, is this a something that they can? Uh, uh, share with colleagues is there a, a financial uh you know will improve their financial status i suppose uh, uh, among clients um you know how, how would you see life after the program so to say, so to speak peter do you want to take this yeah i mean you are the closest yeah just i'll give you a couple of things um uh, the, the one thing we've we've talked about 
working with colleagues and all the rest of it, but I find it a great tool talking to my customers about what I'm up to. They love to know that I'm doing CPD, that I'm learning, that I'm taking to them. I have a big bag of bits of horses' feet that sit on the back of the van, and quite often I can waste an hour talking to people about progress about things i've seen in the states when i've come over and the new things that are around um and this is just another of those things um it enriches my life it enriches their life um as for making more money you're worth what you think you're worth if you want to if you want to you know if you want to do the numbers and crunch the numbers of horses or you want to to provide a service and understand and pass that knowledge on to the client so the client understands what you're trying to achieve, then you're worth more money. It's not a question of per set of shoes. It's the amount of time you spend with someone. So I find it an amazing tool for engaging with my customers. My first module, my customers had it all the time. It was one of the topics we talked about, what I was doing and where I was on the module. And then they all wanted to know how I'd got on. So fortunately, I was allowed to tell them that I was, I'd was, passed that module and was moving on to the second one. So, you know, that's to me the benefit. If I can add to that a little bit, uh, Peter, I think that's a great point. There's also the question of, of uh, I'll say ownership of the farrier you know, community. I mean, of, of the 157 papers that Renata referenced earlier, I would hazard to guess that very few of those were actually uh, research projects that were designed and completed by farriers. And I do think there's a lot of frustration from the farrier community that uh, that people tell us what to do, that people are dictating how we um, direct our, our, our shoeing practices. Well, this is an opportunity for us to have a little bit of ownership of that. If we have a unique perspective, and I really do think that farriers have a unique perspective on the foot, this is a good opportunity for us as an industry to demonstrate that and to take a little bit of ownership of, of how we conduct our business and, and how we, the practices that we're asked to do. I, I, I think this is a really, really unique opportunity for us to, uh, to direct the future of the farrier business or the farrier industry. Could I quickly add to that because uh, it's a really important point and um, our external examiner who teaches um, master's level equine science was so impressed with the level of the um, essays that were being written by our farriers and she said they're of a similar standard and the increase in confidence in the self um, and in confidence and in, in communicating at this level with, um, with people that perhaps um, the farriers we work with hadn't felt confident to communicate with was just gorgeous for us to watch and to be part of. So there's, there's a huge amount of confidence building um, that goes on when you're undertaking these courses. And if that happens to the profession as a whole, then that's going to be a really great thing. Okay. Um, going back to the application process, uh, could you define veterinary surgeon? Uh, I think uh, just wanting to, uh, a person here wants to make sure that they understand, you know, they work alongside vets, but uh, could you, I guess, maybe give the qualification of a, a veterinary surgeon? Uh, okay, so maybe that's just a UK versus American English issue because in, in the in the UK all uh, veterinarians are called veterinary surgeons, despite the fact that they might not use a scalpel blade. Um, so anybody with a veterinary degree who is allowed to practice veterinary medicine. Okay. All right, and then uh, where will our work be published? You had mentioned the fellowship potential. Uh, what what other uh, journals or publications would our work be would be published? Um, okay, so this is two different things, really. So the fellowship um, is obviously uh, one part of the uh, which a company of farriers. Uh, uh, the, the thesis is one part of the uh, Worshipful Company of Farriers fellowship requirements. Uh, 
that's not a publication as such. Uh, so that is independent from publishing in a scientific journal. And I would be hopeful that we would uh, produce uh, work of the uh, quality of the work that we could submit to, for example, the Equine Veterinary Journal, uh, that we could uh, submit to the, uh, the American Journal of Veterinary Research and so on. However, uh, there's nothing, so these are all veterinary journals, but there's nothing wrong with, for example, also uh, publishing in the uh, American Ferris Journal uh, the, the one thing I would say is that it, it's always, it's quite funny in, in this whole scientific publication business. Uh, if you go for peer-reviewed scientific journals, uh, you sometimes fail to reach your target audience on the shop floor. Whereas if you go for journals that are not peer-reviewed, you like the American first journal or the, uh, the Forge magazine in the UK, you will reach your target audience, but it's not peer reviewed, so it doesn't really count as scientific journal. So I think it depends a little bit on uh, the type of study one does, uh, but also uh, your personal preferences. What is the aim? What do you want to do? Personally, I get paid to publish sci in scientific journals. But what we usually do, we also uh, often produce a, a summary uh, to be published in uh, journals to, to the target audience. So a few weeks ago, I'll I give you an example. A few weeks ago, we published a study where we looked into the effect of Equiband, uh, the um, physio support system uh, that you can buy for horses and use in horses on gait. And that got published in the Equine Veterinary Journal where other vets and other equine scientists read it. But really where we wanted it to go to, what I wanted, uh, I wanted people to know like uh, physios, uh, like the horse owners. So we've also published a summary in Horse and Hound. Uh, so this can, this is how, how one could manage publications. But regardless of where it ends up, I really, really want it to be of the standard that it will withstand peer review, scientific peer review, that it will be robust uh, and solid in its methodology and how it was done and in its results and conclusions. Okay. Um, is there a, uh, do you have data of the first, uh, you've done this once, uh, the acceptance rate and uh, do you have enough uh, to know about a completion rate? Ah, uh, we only have one cohort so far. <laughs> uh, so at the moment, we were oversubscribed. Um, uh, da -da. So the acceptance rate was under 100%. Uh, I can't remember the exact percentage what it was, to be perfectly honest. I would need to ask our admissions team. Um, the, we had one student, Rachel, we had one student drop out yeah. for personal reasons and yeah. one student has put his studies on hold for medical reasons. Uh, so at the moment we have an extraordinarily high um, retainment rate uh, for, for any cohort of students, which I think again reflects the extraordinary dedication uh, these students show. And I think um, it's an important point because the what the the contemporary study skills module gives you is an opportunity over a relatively short period of time and a smaller amount of money to test the waters and to see if this is really something you have the time for, the energy, the enthusiasm, because it is hard work. And, and actually, I'm yet to find a student who can't do it, but actually with with other factors going on some people that the planets all collide at once and and now isn't the right time so so this first module does give you a chance to test the waters and then make a decision about whether or not you're able to continue on okay uh the remaining questions that i have uh, regard the residential weekends uh first how many are there six okay three, three per year is that right uh, no, it's a bit asymmetrical. So uh, it starts, the course starts in January 
uh, with the Contemporary Studies Skills module, you will find out in May whether you've passed or not. Then there is a bit of a hiatus during the summer because we, we worked, when we developed this course, we listened to uh, some farriers who told us, we are busy in summer, don't bother us with, uh, with studying. So um, there is a hiatus from basically April you submit till September when it starts off. Then all the modules uh, you will have four modules uh, between September and spring the following year. Then again, there is uh, basically a free late spring summer. And then you come back with your research project uh, at the end of the second year. Okay. Um, I guess uh, maybe Peter, you should answer this is maybe describe what those days are like, um, you know, the, the hours invested, uh, how many people work together, um, just maybe a little description of how those days yeah, operate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot, it, 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 it becomes natural because you think about it a lot, you talk about it a lot, um, you talk to the other guys on the course, you also talk to your client base, because I've got, a very broad range of clients from solicitors through to taxi drivers to paper boys but everybody everybody can give you a bit of advice on what you're doing whether you take it forward or not and that sounds odd but it's amazing when you just generally interact and communicate with people um they give you snippets of information um towards the end when we were handing in it was very hardcore um because you've got the final date it's creeping up on you um and and I, I would say the last three days before i handed in it was all about that and i was quite happy to hand hand the, the piece of work over and be done with it but the lead up um every week you have a piece to complete and you will do the 10 or 15 hours but not as everybody says sitting at a computer you do a lot of thinking a lot of notes i have a um i have a notepad in the van where i jot down notes jot down sentences other guys were using their phones to to dictate into their phones um so it does and the great thing because we stop after 14 weeks and then you go you know we're all busy you can kind of relax and get on with your life and then we're really geared up as i say we're really geared up for september and chomping at the bit ready to get back into into harness and get on with it so um yeah it's just that lead in like with anything when you put anything on or do anything that last few days is quite hardcore but leading up to it every week you get a piece of work that you have to hand in on a certain time and you get it done you get it done on the deadline um, and it comes and goes you pick up the next bit and you get into after about the third week you're into a routine you know it's coming you get it done it's a bit like you've got 20 horses lined up they've got to be shod you just get on and do it um Pete, I think I, I'm just wondering, Jeremy, if the question was also about the um, the weekends. Maybe I'll give a little bit on the weekend, and then Pete could join in. Um, so the weekends are uh, just a typical nine to five day. Um, I don't don't know if we exactly had nine to five, um, but everyone was in. We had um, myself and another um, two tutors on our team. We had Amy Barstow was in, Renata and Tilo were in. Um, and we ran sessions through those days, group work. Um, we ran one-to-one -to -one tutorials so students can talk to us about their concerns around the learning. Um, we, we undertook activities. Um, it was very discussion-based. And um, what we were trying to do was answer, uh, get people up and running with their, with their equipment, answer the kinds of questions that we know are going to come up and provide students with that first boost um, ready to send them out into the online world. Um, and, and as I said right at the beginning, for us, it's really about developing that sense of teamwork, of peer support. So I, I can maybe say a little bit about, uh, we, we've just finalized a, a schedule for the September weekend. And it's basically a mixture between lectures, practical sessions, discussion sessions, uh and, and so on so there's some some heavy lectures in there i would say but i have a very short attention span and i really don't want to torture anybody too long with with content 
So we are also going to look at videos of lame horses. We're going to discuss how certain landing patterns changes the biomechanics and, and so on. So it's very interactively uh, way designed to be interactive and, and have discussion time built in. Okay. Um, I have one final question here. Can I, can I do my research work together with another farrier who doesn't attend the course, but would do part of the data collection? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically, I like uh, teamwork. And everybody has, as, as a requirement, uh, uh, it, it is a requirement that everybody answers a specific individual research question. So we can't have two students answer the same questions. However, what we could have is two students uh, using the same data collection. And it could be something as simple as how does a certain type of shoeing intervention change the gait in the front limbs? And how does it change the gait in the hind limbs? So one student could do front limbs, one student could do hind limbs. The same data collection, same horses could be used. So that's two distinct research questions. Uh, and I'm all about synergy. I'm all about uh, making the most of it. Because if you have two students using the same data collection, uh, you can get the double number of horses done, which uh, increases the power of your study. So rather than one student going off in uh, you know, one part of the country doing 20 horses and the other student going off in another part of the country doing struggling to get 20 horses, they could work together and they could get 40 horses. So I'm all for synergy. Uh, can you rope in other people to help you collect data? Absolutely, you can. Uh, it's sometimes a fine line to walk. Uh, if you basically coax them into acting as your technicians, but you are the intellectual lead, and you can, there's no doubt about that, that it's your idea, your study design, but you have friends who help you collect data, that's perfectly allowable. Okay. Well, with that, I'll, I'll thank all of our presenters. And again, that's Dr. Renato Eller, Dr. Rachel Davis, Peter Day, and, and Pat Riley. Uh, thank you all. And Thank you, uh, thank you everybody. And uh, we're certainly uh, fortunate to have their input. All four of these people are very instrumental in helping advance the profession of farriery. Uh, I also want to thank Equilox. Again, you can learn more about their products at equilox.com. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I think those were some great questions. Uh, a terrific sampling of farriers throughout the US. Even a couple of vets peeked their heads in to, to see what was going on. Uh, if you missed any of this webinar or you would simply like to rewatch it to get any of the information provided, please, please visit AmericanFarriers.com after 5 p.m. tomorrow to find it. We'll also email a link to this webinar so uh, you'll, you'll get a link to this, to this video. Uh, before I leave, I'd like to thank each of you for attending and being part of the webinar. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me. I'm Jeremy McGovern, and that's J-M-C-G-O-V-E-R-N at lespub.com. Thank you again, and have a great night. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Bye.